Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices in connection with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Thank you for your letters and comments. We answer them when we have time. Uh, today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Michelle Lutz, a physician who is the founder of Human Info NGO and the sister organization of World Information Transfer. He is also WITS Regional Director for EU and has been working for 25 years with various UN agencies. With a team of 60 people, he developed over 200 databases and helped to digitize more than 50,000 UN publications. Inspired by the UN Knowledge Library and Best Practices, he co-founded and is the CEO of Trido House, a triangular house with sustainable utilities to help solve the world's urban slum poverty and refugee centers. Over to you, Dr. Lutz. Uh, thank you very much for this nice introduction, Christine. And I'm very pleased that I can present today uh, to our friends and uh, with friends and, and also UN friends to the Tradial House concept of how to solve this uh, one of the biggest problems in the world. Uh, there are many problems, but this is one of the big ones, this uh, urban slum poverty. And just to um, talk a little bit about our collaboration, the, 20, the last 25 years, so we work together um, with 15 UN agencies to scan and help bring in open source about 50,000 UN publications, and that's 5 million pages. You see at the left side here, some of those 200 databases. And we did this because we know most of those publications, they contain basically 80% of the solutions for all the world problems. Huh? The UN has such a vast uh, basis of knowledge and of uh, expertise and also of experience of how problems are developing in some countries and are solved, that this is really an extremely valuable database um, that can help solve most of these problems. Okay? And one of those problems that was always very worrying to me was this kind of urban slum problem, the poverty. And that's why we also decided to develop Tridial House, a kind of solution, which is based on the composition of all those solutions of the UN. And that's a new type of uh, what I call a vaccination strategy for an SDG industry creation to help solve those world problems. And what we found out is that you need five stakeholders to help solve those problems. You need the governments, you need the UN ODA because they are the validators, they are the catalysts, they create cooperation amongst borders, about con amongst countries. You need the universities and research and development institutions because they are going to increase the value and the local adapt adaptability of this uh, information and knowledge. And you also need the industry because the industry, why are we so pro prospicuous uh, and efficient and productive in our world? Because of the free market of the industries who developed ever more efficient ways of producing, but that should be used to also help solve the urban, the human needs, the, the basic human needs. So we need this technology of the industry. And finally, we also need money, of course, investment, but preferably impact investors or foundations. And this is what we try to solve with Tridale House. And it's an endeavor to develop an SDG industrial model to help solve the urban slum poverty. And that's what the 25 slides that I will present here uh, are about. So the urban slums and also the refugees who are also a part of these slums, of course, eh, they have small urban or semi-urban settlements with all these refugees. That's about 1 billion people, yeah? um, 300 million slum families, of which 60 million in Africa, uh, 60 million people in, in slums. So it's a huge problem. One seventh of the world population is suffering from it. Basic needs are not met. They are too poor to acquire any house. They are trapped in this 
very, you know, almost impossible to, to, to escape out of this poverty and malnutrition cycle, and they cannot participate in the economy. And even Warren Buffett said that it's not possible to find a solution to solve the poverty of the bottom billion. But that's maybe because you only see it from an industrial perspective. What we try to do is to connect all these stakeholders and also all this information of these 15 UN agencies, the best practices. And if you connect them and try to create a virtuous circle of prosperity or economic uh, lifting up the people, that's where we think it is possible to solve this problem. And what, that's what we call the tridial house. It's an ideal triangular house. And one of the main features is that's a self-financing house and produces food. Huh? Uh, and it's also based on these UN ODA best practices. And that's why we also have a lot of support, of course, because people recognize, uh, and I always say, it's not my idea, it's not my invention. I'm just composing out of the existing best practices. Uh, our friends at the UN, they recognize this, they see this. So the five slum household deprivations as defined by UN Habitat are first of all, the water problem. Eh? You have to have access to water, drinking water or agricultural water. Sanitation facilities, that's a very important problem. Uh, people need a toilet and a shower or a way to clean themselves. Durability of the housing. So we decided that for example, for Africa, the population will triple the next 80 years. Um, and you cannot rebuild houses every 20 years because then not only you have to build three times more houses, but you have to build four times the same houses. So that's 12 times more. So that's why we try to develop the house with 80 years durability in mind by using the best technologies and practices, but also by using local materials or local cement. So we need, of course, a house with sufficient living area around 20, 34 up to 60 square meters for very big families, a secure tenure. And the advantage of our house is, of course, the land is uh, not under the house, but on the roof of the house. And the house is somewhat mobile. So you can place it from one place to another uh, if necessary with limited costs. But that's only about the UN habitat deprivation. This is not solving the problem, how to create this, uh, how to solve this problem, how to finance it. And so we added the urban farming, micro job and food production component. Whereas one third of the food, uh, the lesser quality strawberries or whatever are used for own consumption and two thirds for local exchange and the revenue generation, combining a micro job with caring for children and early. But of course it's a mass production problem because you cannot build one or two or five houses at a certain point you have to produce masses of houses so our concept of production is based on the industrial standards of modular mass production and so it's a steel frame and then we have uh, composite panels in concrete uh, different type of concrete and foam concrete and then you see on the left side how these houses are conceived inside. It's a little bit like these small Japanese houses where every corner, every inch square feet is well uh, thought of. And then you can create really a kind of nice uh, family environment. The materials we will use have to last 80 years. And that's possible. Even if you invest 10 to 20% more in the material costs in, at the start, um, the profiles are from special type of steel. We work with ArcelorMittal, the main uh, global research uh, department of ArcelorMittal, OCAS, that's based in Belgium here. And so you will have two levels, the ground level and some mezzanine, and of course, the urban farming, but no urban farming without water. So because in the most developing countries, you have this monsoon um, uh, periods of uh, very rainy periods followed by dry periods, uh, every house has a tank a number of tanks up to 18 to 20 cubic meters, depending on the local uh, rain patterns, so that the water is collected during the rainy seasons. And there is also a possibility to use this water during the dry season, at least a big part of the dry season. So, but of course, what we will provide is 80% the basic, the standard house with, with structural engineering, and we also work with the local universities to adapt this to 
to local uh, cultural uh, uh, shapes and, and customs. And, and this is uh, our first country we work with is uh, Ethiopia. So we will also integrate colors and, because the house not only has to have the function of the house in urban agriculture, it also has to be a very nice place to live where people feel secure and where they feel happy. And it's one of the most important aspects of a, a house uh, to feel really uh, at home. Eh? And this means at home in your own culture. And this is why we work with these universities. But of course, the house also has to have sustainable utilities. Most of the time, it's not possible to have regular um, electricity or uh, water, etc. So we, on, we will not use pumps, electric pumps, but for example, we use a treadle pump, which is uh, operated by feet or by hand. We'll have also, every house will have uh, some solar panels. We also work with University of Leuven, who invented the kind of hydrogen producing panel. And of course, catching the water. If you see here, the, the inspiration of this project came from we, when we saw uh, this de de devastating typhoon, high one, in um, uh, the Philippines about five years ago. It's uh, 1.80, so 1 million 80,000 houses were destroyed. And the advantage of a house like this, first of all, it's collecting water, so it will mitigate somewhat the floods. But also the steel profiles can be adapted to the strength of the strongest hurricane. So the, the, the thickness of the steel can be modulated in function of structural engineering calculations to withstand these extremely strong winds. Huh? So that's why we call this a climate resilient house. And for example, we had some discussions with, um, at the UN Habitat Conference uh, two years ago with some of the World Bank people who were financing rebuilding the houses in Mozambique. There was also a big hurricane there. And they were very interested in this concept because you can rebuild, but what if in five years from now, there will be again a hurricane of 250 kilometer per hour winds. So, but of course, besides all these uh, climate resilient components, uh, the only way we can create a sustainable way of providing enough houses to these urban poor is if they can repay it, the house themselves. So the house has to generate some revenues. Eh? And we calculated that the industrial scale manufacturing cost of one house is 10,000 to $12,000. Uh, in case of uh, Ethiopia, around 60 to 70 percent will be in local currency, and 30 percent in in dollars at mass production. And then the question is, because this even for developing countries, this is a still substantial amount of money. So the question is, can it produce 800 dollars of cash and some own food? And if this can be proven, and if this is the case, and we, we think we make the case that this is uh, surely the, the, the case, then a micro loan uh, can be repaid at 10 to 15 years uh, mortgage rate at around 5% inflation corrected interest. And so people become owner of their house, yeah? but not only they produce food, they also save on rent because the average uh, slum inhabitant is paying between five and 20 or 25 dollars per year uh, per month in rent so he's saving this huh? also charcoal can be saved because we will have these solar panels so we think the house can be repaid even by the poorest with adapted microfinancing support and monitoring mechanisms and that's why of course we have to work with the governments now, just to give you an idea of the type of food that can be grown on a house, on a house like this, uh, these are all kinds of ideas ranging from uh, simple uh, vegetables, still fruits, uh, uh, sweet potatoes, um, fodder for, for, for the animals. But also on top, we will have some chicken enclosure for every house to have minimum five to seven chicken. It could be, it's not standard, but a possibility to have some small aquaculture tanks under the house or to raise rabbits, or also uh, that would be standard uh, to raise some mushrooms under the house. Yeah. And so it's possible with this kind of technology to have five to six times higher productivity because the water uh, is used much more efficiently. And also the, the, 
the garden or the vegetable urban farm is on the roof so people can access it every day and weed out weeds and stuff like that. And here is an example, our director of Africa, uh, we will produce those gutters also in Ethiopia. And uh, the, 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 the amount of fruits and vegetables that can be produced is really uh, amazing. Huh? And for example, here at the right side, we have a list of uh, all kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables ranging from beans to concombers, eggplants, lettuce, etc. So the yield per harvest could be two and a half kilograms per square meter. So that means 200 kilograms per harvest, but there would be three to four harvests per year, depending on the climate. So this means four to 500 kilograms of fruits and vegetables. This means people get an income, uh, get some something to sell, to exchange. And if you have some chicken on top as well, that's 1,000 to 1,500 eggs every year. Uh, and at the average, price of an egg in the slums, maybe eight, eight dollar cent or something in that order. Yeah, that's another hundred to hundred fifty uh, dollars per year. Yeah, that adds up to our eight hundred dollars yeah, and the mushrooms the same. Yeah. So that's why we are saying and demonstrating that 3 House actually fulfills 12 of the 17 sustainable development goals. Yeah. And the most important, of course, is no poverty. Yeah zero hunger, uh, we always say that we aim to, to meet 50 to 70% of those SDGs. Of course, it's a kind of distribution, Gauss distribution all the time of what you can achieve in, in, in any situation, but we will have a uh, significant impact on all those 12. So the hunger, the good health and well-being, uh, because we have a healthy and happy environment, the gender equality, because basically, the house is empowering women and children. Huh? Uh, and that's the most important. They are the backbones of the economies in these countries and of the families. Clean water and sanitation. So we will fulfill or at least meet in significant way the wash needs. Huh? And also every house has its own toilet. And I will show you the type of technology we are developing or using for this. And that's quite uh, interesting. So the affordable and clean energy, because on top of the chicken enclosure, on top of the house, there will be solar panels. Uh, chicken need light to lick eggs, but they also need um, shadow, uh, not to, to be too warm. So decent work and economic growth. So we try to lift people from zero to 10. And once they are at 10, they have some basic needs fulfilled and they can start to think about how can I uh, start growing myself uh, in economically. Reduced inequality, uh, of course, because we empower the poorest and also many people do not have any pension ret ret uh, retiree scheme. So for people who are retiring, the house is also a source of food and income. And of course, the sustainable cities and communities, it's evident that if we create this, this kind of SDG compliant houses in the slums, that this contributes to better communities and also to responsible con uh, consumption. The climate action we demonstrated uh, with, with uh, uh, first of all, resilience uh, against these uh, extreme weather uh, events, but also, of course, uh, by using as much as possible these uh, new type of solar panels and uh, converting the, the waste in biomass, etc. And last not least, of course, it's partnerships. And so there, there are those five types of stakeholders for, without which the project is impossible to implement. We need the government because they are providing land and the support. We need the UN, we need universities, industry, and also the uh, impact investors. And uh, we have all of them on board for Tridal House. So we first created a small prototype of one third scale. And this was presented at the 2019 UN Habitat Assembly of Governments for the Innovation for Better Quality of Life in Cities. And then you see one of the tweets. So uh, Mayuma Mot Sharif, uh, the Director General of uh, UN Habitat and uh, Assistant Director General of the United Nations. She says herself, she lived herself uh, when she was young in really quite, uh, let's say lower uh, quality uh, dwellings. And she said, uh, Tridal House, a unique modular precast concrete house produces food, generates revenue and can be financed. So she was very supportive for our project, we also were broadcasted by the some television stations in uh, in Africa. But the response, both from grassroots 
uh, from slum dwellers international, from architects, from government uh, cabinet members, ministers, was uh, extremely positive. So this has uh, encouraged us to, to pursue this and to continue. This. Of course, we had the COVID meantime, meanwhile, that created some delay, but we are still now uh, going back uh, full, full speed. Huh? Now, of course, it's all about manufacturing. At a certain point, it's about an industrial process because otherwise you can deliver 50 houses, 100 houses, but never, never meet the local needs. Uh, and we want to produce as much as possible locally. So here you see the concept of this modular system, the structural engineering adapted to each country and the stronger hurricanes. And also we use special magnelia steel, which was invented also by Belgium uh, ArcelorMittal uh, Ocas uh, Research Center. And this steel lasts 80 years without repainting. Because after 10, 20 years, if the steel is rusting, even if it's galvanized, if people have to choose between feeding their children or buying some expensive paint, because that's quite expensive paint, they will choose to feed their children, of course, and then the house will gradually collapse in those tropical uh, environment. We also developed with another research institute, super strong concrete with super fine fly ash with wastes, basically, from the coal power stations. So because of this cooperation with all these research centers and universities, we get access to the best technology. But even then, it's about people. And so it's not only needed to have one house, right? and that's not our goal to have an individual house. Our goal is to create and recreate the village concept from which the people most of the time are escaping from the rural poverty to improve a little bit in the urban poverty. And so our goal is to create a kind of hamlet of uh, 50 ground levels. That's normal, a normal uh, square, uh, house, let's say, or apartment. And on top of that, everywhere we see the red uh, roofs, uh, but then it will be two by two, it's a tridel house. And then you have the internal garden, so the, which is a totally protected garden where the children can play, but also you will have some goats or uh, moringa trees and acacia trees and, and maybe some coffee plants or whatever. And then there can be a community uh, uh, interaction in social engineering where uh, elderly, uh, people can watch out for the children while the mothers are working, etc. And where you can have uh, common uh, uh, amenities such as the biogas converters, etc. And this way, we think we can house 20,000 people in this. And I can assure you, that this is an example. That's the most idyllic place in Belgium, uh, one kilometer from where I live. And I interviewed some people there. There is so much social interaction with this system. Huh? So people are really happy. And we could house 20,000 people per square kilometer, which is not enough for slums because a typical slum is 100,000 to 200,000, but is not producing anything, is not in any way sustainable. And here we will produce on this one square kilometer as much food as normally on one square kilometer of farmland. So this is a uh, less density, uh, uh, but still a very high density. Uh, um, and, but the only way to create this kind of community engineering and empowerment. So before uh, yeah, uh, I go to some other details, these are the eight necessary dimensions for sustainable outreach. So these are the eight conditions to succeed. Otherwise, this project cannot um, succeed in any country. The price per house has to be $12,000 or less. For every $1,000 more, we calculated that 10% of the slum people will not be able to, to find, finance it. Some of them have external jobs, so some of them could afford 15, 16, 18,000, but not uh, the bulk of them. It has to be a modular system because you go to the site, it has to be built in one day okay, or two days. Uh, we also work, most of our shareholders, so we are a company, but actually with the statutes of an NGO, but uh, because we are dealing with houses, we, so we have a kind of commercial setup, eh? but we, our main shareholders are foundations, uh, our humanitarian uh, oriented uh, impact investors, and we will do just a transparent 4% net profit margin so that we can reinvest and expand. And also that was one of the conditions of the World Bank not to create a project which just spending and then stops because it's not sustainable, but a project who can repay the loans when we want to start a factory, etc. 
The durability has to be 80 years. Huh? We explain this because the maintenance has to be minimum. And also the population in Africa will triple and eh? in other countries it will double. So you cannot afford to <laughs> double or triple the number of houses and then have to rebuild it every 20 years as well. Huh? Of course, we have to conform to all the building codes locally. Huh? And that's why we work with local universities. It has to about have an urban farming and SDG component that you saw and 75% of the material source must be national or regionally sourced uh, materials. And we will also transfer innovation and technology. That's what we are already doing with uh, the Ethiopian government. So the last row, of course, cooperation with government, UN, the universities, industry, impact investors. I explained why this is without those five stakeholders. It's, even if one is missing, it's not possible. And what we want to achieve is to create uh, peer supported factories where around 50% of the people minimum would be from the slums. So this means we will also integrate uh, training uh, programs, etc. Now, it's an enormous problem, an enormous scale. So at the end, when the product is ready, it's like a vaccine. You have to have the money to scale it financially. So we think we can raise, till now we raised enough to create our first five full prototypes, which will be ready around September, October. And after that, even we also have already some funds for the next 20 ones. Um, so we think we can find the equity and the capital to build factories once we scale up at a very high you know, scale in, in each country. But that's not the problem. The foreign currency can be solved. The most important aspect is uh, housing loans. So the government has to participate to provide housing loans. And our project is unique in that way that the house is not a consumption product. If you create, if you provide money or print money, basically by giving loans or by printing actually paper money, you create enormous inflation. If people are just using it for consumption and a house is the ultimate consumption product, of course. But if the house is not a consumption product, but a productive um, asset, which increases the GDP, this means the house produces economic activity and, and food. So this is sold. So it creates a cascade of economic uh, circle, a virtuous uh, circle. Then the GDP will rise and uh, the loans who are giving in the 75% local currency loans are not generating inflation or hyperinflation, but are compensated by the growth of GDP. So therefore we think, and we discuss this with some cabinet ministers, even uh, cabinet uh, chiefs of the, I think the minister of housing of the Philippines, he was an economist. And so he was not 100% convinced, but somehow he said, yes, it could be a word, but it's the reality of the economics. If the United States is printing continually uh, new dollars, but it's not generating inflation because the economy is growing more than the number of dollars generated. And so that's what the effect of this house will be. And that's why it's so interesting concept to create a house which also increases the GDP. Now we are uh, of course uh, a team uh, right now with 15 people also in, in Ethiopia, but these are basically the founders, uh, myself, and also uh, at the bottom, Mr. Eddie Danil, uh, he has a kind of orphanage, uh, and support uh, NGO in Ethiopia that he founded 20 years ago. And that's how he brought me in contact with, uh, with the minister in, in Ethiopia, which uh, gave us the first uh, opportunity to start this project. But right now, uh, it's not very gender balanced, but I can assure you we are hiring uh, my, my deputy assistant. Uh, is a very nice uh, lady who just graduated from university. And so we will be completely gender uh, balanced. So that's what's uh, the general presentation. Uh, and I also want to show you some innovation and technologies uh, that we are using. And all of them are very durable, uh, but at the same time, low in cost and can in principle may be made locally. Uh, that's very important. Uh, and one of them is uh, the panels, the side panels. And you see me here, you don't see my face, but this, uh, this white panel, uh, these are the kind of side panels. They weigh 100 kilograms. But they are made, made of composite uh, concrete, very ultra strong concrete with foam concrete inside uh, to, for maximum durability. So we combine foam concrete 
Then we will also use for the toilets, for the uh, urinals, uh, sulfur concrete uh, for sewerage. And we work with uh, the Bonte, which is a partner of us, which is a Belgian company who has the worldwide patent rights from the Shell sulfur concrete technology. So they are uh, the ones who make this. And the sulfur concrete is ideal to resist uh, sewerage uh, because every house will have its own, its own toilet. So we, it has to be resistant on very long term against the acidity of the, of the urine. We will include not um, steel rebars in the house, but basalt rebars. And in the case of Ethiopia, they are sitting on 600,000 square kilometers with a layer of a few hundred meters of basaltic rocks. So from basalt, you can also make uh, basalt wool, but also rebars. So that's uh, one of these materials. We will also, to make our molds, we need molds and we need not big quantities, but somehow some rubber or silicones in the house. And we will do this with recycled rubber of the uh, tires, but we use Evonik technology. So Evonik is one of the major uh, German chemical companies and they invent all kinds of products. But one of them is Westenamer, which uh, recreates almost the same rubber than you had originally. So it's one of the best products and they're fully supportive. Yeah? So that's an example how the industry, the newest technology of the industry is kind of uh, helping us to, to create those uh, long lasting products and they are willing to help us in any way eh? also of course free samples but after that uh, preferable uh, preferable uh, prices etc then of course in the house we will also need wood and unfortunately in many developing countries you have those invasive species of wood and one of them uh, quite dramatic one is prosopis uh, juliflora and that's invading 10000 square kilometers of uh, basically what was uh, fertile urban uh, uh, fertile uh, rural farmland in ethiopia and the roots it was introduced i think 40 50 years ago because it thrives very well in a dry climate and <laughs> the reason is that the roots go up to 50 meters deep but it sucks all the water and so what you don't probably you cannot read it but on this article of kabi it estimates the damage between 320 million and 470 million uh, net benefits who are lost per year because of these uh, prosopis plants who invade everything because they are sucking the water from the aquifers. They are, they are literally uh, monopolizing the complete uh, environment. Huh? And so our idea is to use this wood because it's actually it's a very good quality wood. Uh, and also maybe use the leaves to create biomass uh, gasification, etc., to make the cement. And so that's one example of how for every country we are looking everywhere, what kind of resources can we use, local resources in these houses. Eh? Uh, and uh, of course, we, the wood can be used for parquetry, for furniture, etc. Eh? We'll also use uh, fiber reinforced polyester for the walking grids. And the reason is that it's much lighter than steel, of course, much cheaper, but also it lasts 80 years. So for us, that's always a criteria. Does it last long enough? Yeah. So of course, you have to make this locally at a certain point, but this is known technology. So we'll also make the stairs in this material so that they last uh, extra long. And then you see the pricing. If we produce this ourselves for a complete house, it's $400. Yeah of which uh, around uh, $350, say 357 um, of which around 60% foreign currency component. And then very interesting also, we work with Miss Wiss, uh, Belgian inventors, a uh, very nice lady, Mrs. Ellen uh, Lejeune, who developed 10 years ago uh, a kind of urinal for women. Yeah? And so in every trial house, we'll have, and here you see the details, We'll have a unisex urinal, so only for the urine, and it's a dry one, so it's not using water, but it's specially sealed, etc. So you have no other. Um, and also, we'll use one of those uh, toilet inventions uh, for uh, for for uh, the fingers. But but so the the urinals, um, what we'll do is collect these in the slums, because. For example, 250,000 slum inhabitants, they produce 80,000 
tons or 80,000 cubic meters of, of urine per year. Huh? And if it's collected separately, in each liter, there is 2.3 grams of nitrogen per liter. Eh? There is also a little bit phosphor, but that's 184 tons of nitrogen. Eh? And you see the chart on top. It's one of those research uh, reports of, uh, I think, from the University or uh, Agricultural Research Center. And it demonstrates that by uh, fertilizing the land with urine, uh, 60 kilogram per hectare, you have the doubling of the yield of mice. So if those, the, just collecting from these 250,000 slum inhabitants uh, the urine every year, uh, and it, in uh, the tree down house is collected separately in those uh, sulfur concrete tanks, you have an increase of mice yield of 4,000 tons. Let's say that we create a sustainable business by taking 30% of this extra yield of 4,000 tons. That's 1,200 tons of uh, increased yield. At the mice, uh, the corn, uh, in Europe we call this mice, uh, in, in the States it's corn, uh, at the corn price of let's say $300 per ton, that's $360,000 revenue. But you can finance two big tanks uh, trucks with this and about 100 smaller kind of tuk -tuk, uh, uh, machines who are collecting this, uh, emptying these urinals. And we'll not do it with uh, electricity and diesel uh, pumps. We'll do it with those uh, treadle pumps. So we'll adapt some specially. And so this can create, we think this will be a sustainable way to care for this uh, sanitation and to, to empty these uh, urinals uh, every three months in every house. And we can even give one or two kilograms of mice floor to every, every person uh, in this house. So that's a way of uh, every component of Tridal House is thinking about how can create, create something sustainable out of this. Yeah? And then of course, the uh, community and then social engineering, and that's so important that I duplicated the site uh, because that's what is going to create a vibrant local community where people, instead of being fearful from each other uh, are creating resilience and solidarity and, and uh, uh, tackling this poverty together and teaching each other, caring for their children or elderly. So I started by saying all this information of the United Nations inspired us. Huh? And we think, we hope Tridal House could be one of the hopefully in some time, many uh, experiments or even success stories of, of how to create an SDG, Sustainable Development Goals Industry, where instead of being market driven and demand driven, because there is no money, so there is no demand, but there is an enormous need, it is need driven and like vaccination, it tries to, to cover these basic needs. You can do this from zero to 10 because there are zero needs met and you try to go to 10. You cannot do it for more because that's the free market who has to decide it's the political will of the leaders of the people. But from zero to 10, I think the system can be used. And in any case, that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to develop ourselves as an example where we know 80% of all world problems, the solutions are no, and that's known. That's what we integrated in this Rydal house. It's not my invention or my I'm a medical doctor. So all my knowledge is based on this pyramid of thousands or tens of thousands of, of colleagues and researchers who have collected this, this knowledge. So you need the five types of stakeholders. And then we apply the vaccination strategy for SDG industry creation. That's what we aim to achieve. And we already work with the five stakeholders. We work with the Ethiopian government. We have already an MOE with the innovation ministry, the minister of um, uh, construction and urban development will also sign one in a few weeks with us. We have full support of many UN, uh, both local UN agencies, but also uh, from uh, UN Habitat. Uh, we work with uh, four uh, universities in Belgium and the main uh, us to Addis Ababa Science and Technical University in uh, Ethiopia. The industry, we have the research center OCAS, which is a joint venture of ArcelorMittal Global Research and the Flemish government. Uh, at, a very big steel factory of Arcelor in, in Belgium here and some other industry uh, companies who are supporting us. And we have also a, a foundation of Mr. Happel, which was a, uh, is a German industrialist who has a foundation in uh, Switzerland, the Happel Foundation, who is financing, uh, let's say, most of the five uh, cost of the five first prototypes. 
So we hope uh, to have the, our full versions uh, around October this year. And so that's why uh, I want to thank, first of all, Christine, because she has been very supportive to me already 25 years. We are very good friends. I'm very uh, grateful to her, but also I admire her for her uh, perseverance of promoting each time you know, these SDGs, the United Nations. And so I thank uh, her that I could present this year uh, at the Virtual Voices, our project. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, very much uh, for your comment and for also providing uh, a wonderful future-oriented solution to achieving sustainable housing for all. I certainly hope that uh, the UN Habitat has been able to uh, view this presentation. Uh, now, what I would like to do is uh, ask a couple of questions uh, and Ariel, I've also sent questions to you so that you can ask afterwards. Uh, this is a question from one of our university students. What reforms are needed to overcome poverty and improve housing? Who should be financing this? Well, uh, Warren Buffett said the bottom billion poorest cannot be solved, according to him, and he's one of he's actually one of the most generous, uh, generous and knowledgeable capitalists. So the pure capitalist system cannot solve it. I think there are two major con uh, conditions. Uh, first of all, you have the, to have those five stakeholders. If the government is not uh, supporting this, uh, you can achieve basically nothing, eh? but you also need this know-how, etc. So these were the conditions I uh, outlined. But even that is not enough because the scale of the problem is of, of such a magnitude and there is no money. So I think the only way, and it's a classical way, eh? they, they say it already 2000 years, I think, in uh, Christianism, uh, you know, give people a net to fish eh? or a way to make nets, uh, a machine to make nets. Eh? And so this housing uh, solution, uh, and that's also what you see in the reports of the World Bank, etc. We have to empower the people economically, uh, and we. What the only thing we did is basically connecting these 15 new agencies know-how in a, creating a kind of virtual a DNA string, which can come to life uh, because not all DNA creates life, but if you create the right DNA uh, strings and and chromosomes. Uh, it can come to life. And so the fact that people can generate their own revenue and their own food and repay the house makes it financially self-sustainable. The other way around will never be possible because the scale is, you're talking about 300 million families. So you multiply this by $10,000. Uh, the official development uh, aid is, uh, I, I don't remember, I think it's 200 billion dollars, but that's also for health and for other infrastructure. So the only way is to empower people that they can repay themselves the house, but you have to help them, lift them from zero to 10. They cannot do them themselves. Warren Buffett said it, so I believe him. So, but we have to bring this. So I hope this answers the question. Uh, the, thank you. And actually, I have a note from one of our board members, Richard Whiteford, uh, who said he would distribute this presentation to uh, the people in Pennsylvania. Ah, okay. So uh, that would be, I think that should help with a lot of our other board members will probably mm -hmm. do the same. And now over to you, Ariel, for the next questions. Yes. Um, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Dr. Lutz. I have many questions for you. The first ah, that's good. <laughs> is, from Anastasia, and she asks, how can people influence on the situation with the housing for the poor? Are there any volunteer opportunities? Ah, okay. Yeah, of course, for us, yeah, personally, now we work both, we just hired a fantastic lady who will help us, who will be a first assistant director, huh? but we also work with uh, the university, um, um, student groups, let's say, who are focused to development aid. Eh? And at a certain point, we would like the main universities to 
maybe pay for one house and to have one house at their campus so that every student can contribute one way or another that architectural students they have their ID to do this or this or, or that to improve because we don't know everything the house should be uh, open a kind of open system where you can continually improve and in integrate new new systems and for example just on the level of uh, nutrition and agriculture um, urban farming we have to combine all those foods uh, we also digitized from the food and nutrition built and from the united nations university i think it was a few ten thousand pages of food and nutrition built -ins. but you realize that many children they need the micronutrients they need an optimal balance between certain vitamins but also the proteins etc and so you have to create uh, eco environments of certain type of plants and vegetables etc for a certain environment and but you have the climate change so those plants they have to be strengthened to resist very dry periods and so the genetic engineering etc very important and that's why we need continually uh, on on that level students who get inspired who are making a master thesis or a phd and on the individual level of course our main activities are in the slums in the developing countries. So we are already in contact with some of those. Uh, and But if we have students who want to join and somehow uh, during two or three months uh, do an internship, uh, not now. Now it's in the conception phase and we do it with, with those professional companies who are masters in the steel and others. But at a certain point, we will suddenly be open for uh, doing uh, interns or, or combinations because you also have to train the local people. Hey, we want a factory where the some people get part of the workforce. They get the work. They help us create these houses. But then you have to train them. You have to make some maybe videos or inspire them and create the kind of a community. And that's where, <coughs> excuse me, there will be a lot of opportunities. But not now, maybe in six months. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm sure that many people on this will be very interested in that opportunity. Um, Dr. Derbeck, I have more questions, but did you want to ask one? Uh, well, uh, yes, there is one uh, that I can ask. And this is, uh, um, do you think it is necessary to secure uh, for life housing for a child born into a uh, poor family? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So, so uh, integrating. In other words, um, the question is: Do you need to immediately secure housing for a child that is born into a poor family? Well, yes. Basically, I think that they are talking about uh, poverty and uh, children born into poor families. You know, of course. Uh, so. This uh, project, uh, the Tridal House, is in first instance empowering the women and their children uh, because they're the ones who are staying uh, at home. Uh, but also the problem, uh, and, and this is one of our co-founders, Mr. Danil, uh, he's supporting thousand uh, uh, three children, uh, partly orphans, and many of those three children, they still have their parents, but they are so poor that they cannot be... Uh, taking into the, the home. Huh? And so that's indeed a very big problem for which we will do this community engineering where the a number of houses, huh? and um, we talk now about street children or children who are, you know, who have so poor parents that they cannot be taken, taken care of. But you all have also have the same with HIV fa uh, affected families, children without parents huh? or children raised by the grandparents. And that's why we want this community engineering by combining 50, let's say 100 families in this small hamlet, you will create some inner solidarity to, to solve this and they can teach themselves informally, etc. So of course, that's our goal eh, to solve this. That's uh, actually a wonderful perspective that basically you could build communities of people that are basically have the same problems and they were able to help each other. That's a very, very good uh, perspective. Over to you, Ariel. Alrighty. Um, so I have a question. Well, I'm going to combine two. 
So can Tridale House be the solution to the problem of overpopulation on the planet? Can it be disassembled and moved to another location? And then is it resilient to natural disasters and extreme environmental conditions in general? Okay. So Michelle, three questions over to you. Yeah. The first one I think is very, very important. <laughs> So the mobility of the house, the resistance. Yeah, I explained already yeah, for the hurricanes, um, the fact that it's modular. First of all, still it's triangular, so it's stronger than a normal structure because the triangles are touching each other. Each other. It's a steel structure, which is also stronger and also reinforced by these concrete panels. And um, basically, um, you choose the strength of the steel the thickness of the steel and the quality of the steel in function of the highest winds, which are expected the next 10 to 20 years. Actually, one of the experiments we will do, but not now, maybe in nine months, well, it's a small dream, is to have one in those, in those uh, wind tunnels that they are using to test planes or rockets or uh, at uh, the, these uh, Airbus are, are doing, um, because it has to resist those winds. Yeah, it's modular. It can be assembled in one day, it can be disassembled in three days, but you lose, of course, all these uh, concrete foundations. Huh? But in principle, it can be moved out. That's important yeah, because that's a, one of the problems when you look at the uh, projections of the, of the uh, increase of size of the cities in Africa, eh, contrary to the United States or to Europe, where it's relatively static, you see that the, the cities are going to double or triple in in scale and so what is a slum now could be become an industrial or a mi middle class neighborhood in 20 years from now so it will be take three four days probably to disassemble a house and and to put it again uh, in another place that's not the case for the hamlets because then you have the ground floor which is uh, in concrete but we don't expect that these people will stay slum urban slum poor because these hamlets will create small middle class of them. So that's not a problem. And then the first question was, uh, I forgot to... The first question was, can Tridal House be a solution to the problem ah, yeah. of a population? Yeah, yeah. Why are people, uh, well, the, of course it's, it's a very complex uh, problem, uh, the, the, the population uh, issue. But generally, when the, the, the prosperity and the security of the people increases, and when people have opportunities to, for, the, the house is not a simple house. Uh, you learn, you, you become independent. And so then the tendency is to have less, less children. But another um, important factor is that the elderly, uh, why do you, why do they want so many children? Also because they have no pension. They have no security for their old age. So if you have a house like this and you know that at your old age, you can have still some eggs and some chicken and maybe some vegetables. At, after 10, 15 years, the house is paid. So then it's a pure revenue of 50 to $100 per month. But that's the kind of pension. Now, then the situation gets reversed. If you have a house like this, you have a pension, but if you have too many children, yeah, then you will have to maybe sell the house or give the house or whatever. So I think raising, you know, the people out of the bottom of the bottom of the, you know, basic needs up to a certain level of dignity and, and security can actually have a very positive effect on, on the, the, the reflex of having more children. Yeah? So I think it will have a positive effect. Thank you. I have also another question, which is on the line of similar what we were just talking about. Um, the refugee problem has been particularly acute in recent years. And this person is wondering, is it possible to not only provide refugees with money and housing, but with opportunities for self-realization? And on that note, I also wanna add my own question, which is 
for a situation like in Cox Bazaar, where you have over a million different Rohingya refugees, how long do you think, or do you think the Tridale House could be like effective in an area like that as well? Well, in principle, the house is modular. Huh? It can be deployed quite rapidly, can be repaid in 10 to 15 years. The problem with all those refugee camps, uh, we discuss this also with, with, with Christine, is that the hosting countries are somewhat reluctant to give them a permanent or semi-permanent status. So for our housing, maybe, maybe because it's modular, because it can be disassembled, maybe the local governments will accept that this is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an acceptable solution. And if then the houses, because there is no reason why we could not, if we want to create small concrete factories for those panels and other, uh, and for the wood, etc., in in slums, in urban slums. So it's the same for refugee camps. Maybe even the level of education in these refugee camps is higher because sometimes it's, it's educated people. So there is no reason whatsoever that they would not be able to also create a part of this housing locally. Uh, and of course, uh, the house and themselves, it could be a very good solution because then, uh, and it's always the same, eh? people have no activity, uh, they are desperate, they have no food, etc. The house somewhat meets a number of these needs. Of course, it will never solve the problem of the refugee status because that's the fundamental problem of finding a new uh, uh, home uh, land. Uh, yeah, but but I, I, I believe uh, refugees is an important problem. On the 1 billion urban slum poor, uh, it's also 60 million eh, of the refugees, type of refugees. So I hope this, this answers the, the question that it's certainly applicable, uh, but it will depend on the political uh, will and authorization of the local governments. Thank you. It certainly does answer my question. I personally, and I'm sure Dr. Derbeck also feels the same way, feel like this initiative is going to make such a massive impact on the world. And I think for the Rohingya also, that situation in the camp, it will be improved a lot. <laughs> but, but, but then I want to uh, respond, in fact, to the pre one of the previous questions. It's impossible for me to do this. Eh? I'm just, I'm like the uh, professor or inventor, let's say, who is composing these thousands of variations of molecules to find this cure or this vaccine against uh, poverty in this case. Eh? But of course, the real vaccination is not done by, by me or the ones who are inventing. It's a complete chain of people who are uh, diagnosing or also uh, applying the vaccine, etc. And so I hope we will be successful, with, I, I think, but we will only be if a lot of people join us then to roll this out eh, in many countries eh, and both local people, but a lot of know-how, eh, we will not ask people to reinvent in each country something new. Eh? No, this is proven. It's not based on our knowledge. It's based on these big practices of the UN. Eh? And then we need this big team of uh, our collaborators, of uh, partners who are helping us to bring this uh, to these other countries. Eh? because it's still a complicated pro project eh, in terms of microfinancing, training, etc. So we will need all the young people who are interested to join us. Eh? They will build this ultimately. Actually, uh, uh, Michel, this is a question that just came in from one of the students uh, of journalism. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Lutz, how can, uh, how can young people influence the situation for the housing for the poor? And are there any young volunteer organizations that can help with this project? Well, yes, for sure. So right now eh, we are in the conception uh, uh, phase or the prototyping, eh, but in, in five, six months from now, we will be open uh, uh, for this, eh, for, for helping. Eh? Now, Warren Buffett, eh? I, I, I respect a number of uh, some people very much in the world, but Bill Gates is certainly one of them, Warren Buffett also. But if, if a person who is uh, 
saying uh, that he will allocate 90% or 99%, I don't remember exactly, of his fortune to help the, this, this solve this problem. But he acknowledges he doesn't know how to lift these one billion, eh, the poor, the bottom billion. Eh? So uh, yes, it's very difficult to solve the poverty, but we think it can be done, but not because we invented this house, because 80% of all the world problems, the solutions are there. They have been published by the UN. And why are we so good friends, Christine? Because 25 years ago, you recognize what I was trying to do. This means getting all this information from these books, which uh, were, were sold or not, not published or not on internet, getting it scanned so that the information is getting out there. This is only one of those many, many problems. But you can find for yourself another problem. And if you look deep into this UN system, and unfortunately, I, I advocate already years to have everything on one server, all this UN information on one central server, because it's only by combining everything and also with entrepreneurial skills that you get the idea, ah, that's how we are going to solve the problem. But it's, you don't have to reinvent the solutions. They are there, they are validated. So I think 80% of all problems in the world, the solutions are there, but it's waiting for entrepreneurs and young students who want to go on the barricades, but not to ask more raise or whatever, but just to say, okay, now we are going to solve this problem. We are spending $10 trillion in COVID. Okay, but that's actually creating inflation because you're giving money to people and there is no economic uh, compensation for it, no growth of the economy. But you could invest three trillion just to put enough windmills. And at that moment, the CO2 would already be diminished. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly with 30 to 50%. So you could advocate that it's proven now it's possible with the push, the, uh, by pushing a button, they can generate five trillion or 10 trillion or 20 trillion that this money is also used for productive uh, purposes to solve these world problems. And our house is not asking money. We will, have, we will need some financing, microfinancing, but it's paying for itself, itself. So if you combine entrepreneurial skills with these problems and solutions as uh, published by the UN, and of course it takes one year or two years for you to, to understand this, but just take this lady who invented this urinal for the woman. That's very important because the woman, they have to feel secure. It's one of the big problem sanitations uh, in those countries. Yeah? And so she's an entrepreneur. She developed this concept 10 years ago and now she's delivering in all over Europe the solution and also helping us. And you could do exactly the same. Yeah? It's out there, but I can only con convince you and, and try to, to inspire you to, 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 to look at the UN, uh, look at what they are saying and follow the UN. And I. I'm sure Christine will agree. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. It's a brilliant food for thought and a wonderful, uh, actually, statement to end this wonderful presentation. And I'm most grateful that you were able to make it. I know how busy you are, and we very much appreciate it. And as you know, it will be a great pleasure, always with you. great pleasure. <laughs> so, thank you again. And uh, I first would like to mention the next week, uh, our presenter is going to be Dr. William Hardy, uh, who is the president and director of the National Veterinary Laboratories. And for the last 51 years, Dr. Hardy has been studying the feline and human retroviruses and zoonotic diseases and pandemics. So please don't forget to join us next week. And Ario, thank you very much for all of your assistance in this presentation. Have a wonderful week and take good care of yourself. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.